welcome to the Mindset Michelle TV show. I'm so excited to have you joining us again today. And I'm so super, super excited for today's guest, Lisa Sasson. Hello, Lisa. How are you going? <laughs> hey, Michelle. It's good to be here. Thanks for having me. It's so fabulous having you on the show. And for those of you that aren't aware who Lisa is, Lisa is the CEO and founder of Unearth. And she spent many, many years, many decades, in fact, even though she doesn't look like she has many decades, <laughs> she actually has a number of decades of experience in the risk space, specialising in, you know, insider threat, human behaviour, cyber, which is a big topical thing throughout the whole world at the moment, and many other areas that I'm sure not all of us are aware of around the word risk. We might just think of, you know, falling over as we cross the street as a risk or driving a car. But I'm so fascinated and interested in how does somebody become a risk expert? So, Lisa, please share with us a little bit more about how you became the fabulous you. <laughs> Thank you, Michelle, for having me. It's lovely to be here. And, um, well, Falling into risk, as you've sort of mentioned, well, you, it's not something you kind of aspire to want to be when you're a kid, right? I don't think I even would have even had that on my radar or even a consideration it was a job. So, yeah, it's not something you tend to grow up thinking, not like, you know, we've talked about fight, being a fireman maybe or, you know, going in and, and um, working in some sort of emergency services where the action is perceived to, to be seen or working in defence or something like that. So, no, when I grew up as a, as a kid, um, my life was very different. So I think, well, first I'll let you know, I actually grew up in New Zealand. So please don't hold that against me. I've actually spent over half my life now in Australia. <laughs> I moved to Australia in my mid-20s. Um, but as I grew up in New Zealand, which is a beautiful country to grow up in, uh, without a doubt, I grew up in a very small sort of valley area, a low socioeconomic sort of area. And um, But my home life wasn't actually as safe as it should have been. So it wasn't as straightforward. Um, you know, I know my family did the best they could. And don't get me wrong, I, I had a, a, an amazing, loving mother that was there for me. But because I was a bit of a, a quirky kid, uh, a shy kid, and an environment where it wasn't, it didn't feel so safe. So my confidence wasn't as, as probably as bold as what a lot of other children would have been. And that actually made me a perfect target also at school. Uh, for bullying. So I kind of had it tough on the home front and the school front for, for many, many years. And um, anyone who's sort of been through that sort of experience, I'm sure can relate. Um, you know, I grew up in a time where bullying wasn't just, it definitely wasn't through cyber. <clears throat> Excuse me, we didn't have cyber then, but it was very much physical, it was, it was definitely emotional. And so as I sort of grew up, I had to learn, one, to understand human behaviour, I had to become super aware of what kind of things triggered people, but also I had to learn how to, to protect myself. Um, and that wasn't something that took me a while to get to that point in that journey. And so I did learn how to protect myself, uh, both physically and I'll say mentally and emotionally, though I, I think that was a bit of a rough journey um, in, in doing that because of my understanding of self-worth, which is one of the challenges I think a lot of kids have when they grow up. But that whole stage of learning to defend myself actually then led for me to learn how to defend others um, and understanding and having a fascination around human behaviour. So it's always been an interest of mine since a young kid without realising it. Um, and then I kind of went off into the world, which was in a, in a roundabout way to try and find out who I was. Now, a lot of people go into the world and they know what they want to be when they grow up, right? Or go and have a career and start setting a course, maybe going through uni, getting a career, um, and it's pretty straight, you know, a straight line, I'd say maybe a few deviations. And then there's people who go into the world who don't have the clear path. Um, and sometimes life takes them on a journey and, and takes them in a roundabout way. But all the skills that they're learning are actually bringing them to a point to be able to then provide a different perspective or skills. And so mine was the latter sort of journey. I had no idea I was going to end up in the risk space when I started outside of doing a lot of uh, physical personal protection. Um, some people call bodyguard work very early on because of some of the skills that I had uh, acquired, um, which was rare for a female to do in a very much a male dominated area, I assure you. But um, but even though that's maybe where I started, once I kind of met my husband, um, my career had to change a lot. So I went into the whole corporate space in different areas. Um, 
I fell in love with technology. I fell in love with a range of other things and, and had some amazing experiences. But there were a couple of things that always stayed true to me. One, uh, because of my connections around law enforcement, military and things like that, people I used to train with when I was doing physical security were always close. And two, um, that my understanding around risk was also always there. So it, it helped me in all the roles that I did to understand human behaviour and different things, but also I found myself always being drawn to those types of opportunities and roles, projects and so forth. Um, and so I've, I've had an unusual perspective in relation to how I've seen the world, um, especially when I've looked at things like risk and opportunity because of just my life experience, right, just for what I've been through. And as a result of that, it also meant that when I started to look at things, I understood the importance of knowing that risk actually starts and ends with people, which you now know um, has become a bit of a tagline associated to me, um, including the, the name of my book. But really, um, it's been a, an unusual journey, but anyone who actually knows my full story, all the people have always said, I'm exactly where I need to be. So if that gives you a little bit of insight. It's, it's a little bit left field, a little bit right field, but it's definitely... Um, brought me to where I am today, which is why we're able to give a really succinct, clear um, approach to how we manage and help people to manage risk. Wow, and and um, I really just want to firstly acknowledge how well and how, um, how how well you tell your story, and and I, I appreciate that there's a lot more in there's a lot more depth to the story, and I just really want to acknowledge firstly that. Um, as somebody with some lived experience as well, it's not always easy to tell your story and to tell it in a way of how it created the person you are today. So I really want to um, acknowledge how well you do that and how well you understand then the drivers around what you do. And um, I think, you know, really acknowledging um, that need from an early age of understanding human drivers and human behaviour because it's a physical safety kind of element, um, isn't really talked about enough. But I, I really um, want to just acknowledge how well you frame it and, and say it in a way that I think really empowers others to then be able to talk about it in a way that is a part of their origin story and in a way also celebrates out of those experiences they've then become the amazing expert and fabulous person that they are today. So it celebrates that journey as well. Yeah, I, I do believe that when people have had to live certain experiences, it makes them acutely aware without them even realising some of the skills that they've obviously mm -hmm. needed to learn. And so if there's ways in which that, you know, through life's journey and, and, and as you mentioned, mine, it's a long one. So it's kind of like it's... Um, it's one that you need over a couple of glasses of wine or something like that. And I know we recently, um, well, last year we invested the time, actually it might have even been the year before now, time's been flying past. And I think it was in 2020, we sat down as a team and went through the values of the business. And the best way we knew how to do that to get to the core of what the values of the business was, was for me to share my story. Um, so we did that. It was facilitated by some amazing people. It's a, it was a very vulnerable moment for myself because I'm not one to usually share a lot of it it's kind of one of those things that a lot of people it's kind of taboo to talk about for some people but for me it was just really personal and I'm quite a, a personal person but I decided that it was really important that we all understood what was really driving um you know what underpins the business that we have today which you know our, our whole our whole purpose is to create a safer world and we do it you know one one workplace one community at a time and so it was really important for the team and the people we work with to, to know why. So I shared my story and that's why I kind of mentioned that most people who hear it, um, and don't get me wrong, there were, there were some tears that were welling up when we went through it, um, but out of respect for the amazing people I've had in my life, you know, it was a great opportunity to, to share that. And then all our values that we share, um, you know, even on our website, they aren't things that are banners. Those are things we, I personally live by. And the business is built up from, so they aren't labels, they're the depth. Yeah, and no, I really get that. Um, uh, I, I hear that and I sense that depth to um, living the talk and, and that, that's the power of that authenticity. And, and I, I again want to just acknowledge how beautifully you role model that, sharing the story, sharing the values and sharing that authenticity about, well, 
um, you have a very personal passion around your business and, and about what it does and the difference it can make. And I think that that's where it makes it interesting and, and I'm sure people will be interested in with that understanding of who you are and what the business and everything stands for, what then does success mean to you? What, what does success mean in that kind of construct? So uh, for me, it goes back to what I sort of shared around, you know, what our, our mission is, which is to help create a safer world. So success for me is finding ways to help make that a reality. And yes, we do it one workplace, one community at a time. Um, and I don't, I have a, you know, obviously a, a, it's a big goal, right, to create a safer world, but it's all in the little things that we do day to day and, and the actions that we take. So, you know, um, I work with kids as well and, and working around mentoring where we create safe environments for them to learn to grow and do things. I do it with the uh, the Tech Girls Super um, Tech Girls Super Competition, Super Tech Girls Competition, um, and um, and I love those sorts of things. So anything where we can show how do you create a safe environment, a safe workplace where you can actually bring people together who have differences, you know, different life story. Even as young kids, they have those. Uh, we definitely do as adults, but. It's important to do it in a respectful manner so we can get the best out of people and put some very sensitive topics on the table, especially when you work in risk management, some very sensitive topics on the table um, and allow people to be able to table them in a way and explore them in a way um, that is one that's safe, but also take them, especially when you talk about risk management being an area that makes most people feel quite anxious, vulnerable, they might even fear it, um, but we able, we're able to show them that there's actually there's actually um, opportunity as the flip side of the whole risk coin, you know, so risk and opportunity, two sides of the same coin. So it's that risk is a pathway to opportunity and, for, and, and often transformation. So that's what we're trying to create as part of that. What does success look like? I think it's to change that mindset and that would probably be the outcome, that risk is a pathway to opportunity and transformation. Fabulous. And, and I really hear here in that that it's also creating that space where it's safe to talk about the risk because when it's framed as the risk can equal an opportunity, we can then kind of get around some of the resistance to talking about risk in the first place if, if it's framed in that way. And, and what a beautiful way I, I keep coming back to, the, you know, creating a safer place for the workplaces and for the community. What a beautiful um focus on success and intention for success that you and, and the organisation have. I also think people would be quite interested because looking at risk in terms of risk and opportunities, it then means when we're talking about creating a successful mindset, many of the people that we have on the show that they're talking about things that might be opportunities on the side on that side of the scale. But I'd be interested also if you have you know, some of the risk areas around if you don't pay attention to this and if you don't pay attention to that um, in terms of risk for not creating a successful mindset or a successful mindset intention because, you know, life has its ups and downs, but it's about that intention that you set for where you want to be going. So what sort of things do you share to create that successful mindset through your life and through your business? Well, um, one is the importance of having that safe environment. But one of the things about risk and, and that I share a lot is that risk actually starts and ends with people because risk is a human concept. We've created risk. There is no risk without people, right? It's something that we are determining the value of something that we think is you know, important to us as a person or a group of people. And so because it's a human construct, you actually then need to embrace the fact that there's power in people to help you look at these situations or these decisions relating to risk, you know, whether it's protecting a building or a person or a place or um, there's exposure to them or whatever it ends up being. It, it, in its simplest form, it comes back to decisions and actions or in some cases even inactions, and, and it's around people. We make those decisions we are the ones that are making the decisions and taking actions to get creative and how we might protect. So what I would probably say around mindset is realise the power of your people, like seriously realise the power of your people. If you look at um, people and all you see is 
employees and, um, you know, you might even see them as being potentially at risk because that's what tends to happen a lot for a lot of organisations when they're trying to manage their risk profile. They're looking for all the areas that where people could make mistakes, um, that, you know, that use, it could be on the technology, it could be um, working in a factory, it could be lots of things where they see human error. Um, and it's true. We as humans, we actually make mistakes. So we have to accept the fact that we're fallible, um, that this happens. Uh, it's not always intentional. Some of these, most, in fact, most mistakes are unintentional, right? But what we also know is there's a correlation between um, in, when people feel safe and protected and feel like the, the organisation or the business is looking after their well-being, that when they feel that um, they are being um treated with respect, treated with care, and that they are deemed valuable, of value, then they also are usually inclined to do the same in return. And that means they become more focused and engaged in the business because disengagement is probably one of the biggest, biggest risks within an organisation that we do not talk about enough. Most organisations think about disengagement as poor performance around productivity. Okay, so I'll give you a couple of quick you know, um, facts around that. So when we talk about people in the workplace and we talk about disengagement, it actually falls under the umbrella of an insider threat it's because of the errors that happened. Um, and that's often where you find a lot of the insider threat incidences that get, that get captured, whether it's through technology or other things that are used, that we know that two thirds of in, insider threat incidences are actually unintentional. And there is a correlation because when people don't feel valued and they don't feel connected to the business, they feel disengaged, right? Or um, some people get to the point of being actively disengaged, then their attention to detail, their intention to seeing where there's problems within the business, risks within the business, a threat within the business, <laughs> tend to be more of the mindset of around, well, that's someone else's problem, right? That's, you know, the business is looking after me, so why do I care? You know, they really have that kind of mindset where they feel more, less effort, less inclined to want to protect the business that it's, it's just, they dismiss it in some ways because they don't feel that the business is supporting them. And one of the things that we often see around this is that how do people go from being engaged and feeling, you know, that they're connected to the business to disengaged? Well, one of the areas that happens is that a lot of organisations and businesses and, 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 you know, smaller companies even, their risk management approach or their risk management strategy is often in conflict to the organisational identity, which means all those values that you're pitching and saying we empower our people and we believe in you and you're, you're bringing them into the business with this mindset of thinking I'm coming in here to contribute and, you know, they want me to really make a difference and they come into the business and suddenly all the all the operational aspects that you've got that you're trying to manage risk to prevent the unintentional incidents that they may make or to protect the people from themselves, some people say, that actually often impedes the ability for a lot of these employees to actually do their job, to do their fundamental role that you've given them KPIs against and, and asking them to do. And so when that happens and they can't do their job, two things happen. Often, they feel like this gets too hard, they get worn down, become disengaged. And the second thing is, if they really feel like they're under pressure and there's a lot of stress associated to performing, then they'll often find workarounds, which also expose the organisation. So this is where I say, there's power in your people. If you have engaged people, they can literally become your risk sensors and tell you ways to do things better, better for the organisations. And usually those things end up being better for your customers as well, because they're they're engaged, they're giving that whole flow through. I'm enjoying being here. They're listening to me. Um, and so I'll actually just quickly use the example of Boeing many years ago was a great but example. Before, of before that. we go into Boeing, because I'm just aware that um, we're going yeah. through a lot oh. of different concepts and uh, to sure. make sure that people are kind of picking up on the different concepts because um, I, I really like to maybe pause and then just break it down. Like, Sorry. So that, because um, I know that you're so super passionate and it's wonderful to hear the passion. So um, if we look at it firstly in terms of, uh, yeah, the disengagement and, and I think although you, the example you're using about is going into work and you're really gung-ho and engaged and enthusiastic, um, some of the operational constraints then lead to that disengagement. 
I, I think, you know, the same can be said around relationships and other areas of life. So um, you, you so beautifully described it around an office environment, but I think the same is true where, in a sense, people's expectations or the realities mean that although you're passionate and want to be engaged and want to be involved and want to be included, you know, in a relationship if the other person controls all the banking account and you don't really have much of a say in it, you know, you might start to get disengaged, whoever, whoever it might be, all the same with, you know, decisions about the children or whatever it might be with a friend where you never get to choose the movie, your friend always picks the movie that you go to. And I think that this is interesting in terms of that mindset of how do people then feel empowered again to actually um, say, and sticking with the work example, you know, you asked me to come in and do this job and these are my suggestions for how to do it, but I can't change anything because the operational structure is in such a way that I can't actually change it. So I love how in that first space around, you know, how do you then have the dialogues and how do you open the communication, going back to that risks and opportunities around, well, the risk is that, if we don't have it structured in this way, the employees could make 20 times more mistakes, accidental mistakes. But if the risk is if we have it structured in that way, then their attention to detail, their motivation, their this, their that drops by 70%. So having that qualitative and quantitative data helps everybody to have those conversations and can help both sides kind of do that giving and taking. So. I think that that first element around that, that disengaging is, you know, really important for people when they're thinking about their own mindset um, to not just recognise that it might be that in your office or in your work environment, in a factory or wherever, that disengagement is, oh, you know, I've got no control, I've got those. It affects the whole of your life and it affects your approach and your sense of empowerment and well-being in every aspect. So making it okay that it's just work or it's just this or it's just that um, is something that I would suggest, you know, to look at because every area gets infected. You're like a whole ecosystem and everything in your ecosystem affects each other. So I think that that's a fabulous point around, you know, that disengagement and that disconnection, whether it's from work or from life or from, from whatever it might be. And um, and agreed. And sorry, I know I do get passionate sometimes when I uh, go on my little rant. So what I was going to say also is that just a couple of things. One, always remember that people touch every aspect of your business, right? So they're making decisions and actions every day that either can do um, give opportunity or actually do harm. And the same thing is, in, and as you said, in life, when you've got people, everybody is part of a community. Everybody's part of a family or even if they live on their own, they're at least part of a community. And so when you've got things going on within work where people become disengaged, you're actually changing their life's journey, their story, because they're carrying weight, pressure and stresses that go along with it. And when people are carrying extra stress, you're not going to get the best out of them in their job and you're certainly not going to get the best out of them always in their life. And so there has to be these things to help offset that and there needs to be positive things. And so I agree with you, you know, the whole thing about people when it comes to engagement, whether it's in the family environment or uh, within work, it's about connection. It's about feeling that connection. It's about feeling that, that they've got a contributing in life, regardless of which side, it's contributing in life. And that's meaningful to them based on their values and who they are as a human being. And really, if you think of, if, if people could show up wholeheartedly as the people that they are um, and do jobs that they enjoy doing and feel passionate about it, could you imagine what the world could possibly look like? I think it could look a lot different than what it does today, for sure, especially if they felt like they're heard and can contribute in, in a safe way. I think there'd be a big difference. And, and I think that this is um, one of those interesting factors around um, your second point to do with um, they stop paying attention to detail and so more and more mistakes happen because um, they're, they're just not engaged. And, and I think that that's where the overall theme of what we're talking about here about that collaboration and the cooperation 
um, is something that whether we're talking about risk or an organizational culture, it, it's really creating that safety around being able to have these conversations and, and it's not always one is going to win or the other is going to win or right or wrong, but it's um, moving into more of that collaborative space to have those conversations. I was even saying again this week that I'd been observing some of what I is called in the culture and change management space, learned helplessness. And that a lot of that stems from what you're talking about where people want to do things, but they can't do things. And so they just learn not to be able to help themselves anymore. They just stop trying to change or fix situations. And I think, um, again, if it happens in one area of your life, then people tend to give up in other areas of their lives. And, and this is where creating those dialogues. And, and I think, as I was saying at the beginning, the beautiful way that you framed and structured the topics that you were talking about, it, these are, you know, it can be a risk and it can be challenging to have these conversations, but the importance of them is, you know, can't be understated. Mm, absolutely. And the other thing that I find is that even on my personal journey, you know, individually, as individuals, you know, we are but a, a drop. You know, if you bring people together um, as a collective, we can become an ocean and of knowledge, experience and skills and ideas and, and ways to actually find better paths forward. And, and when you think about that, it is, you know, I'll go back to the workspace just for a second because there's, there's just usually so many people around you that each play a, a role within a, an organisation. And, and so if you think about that, you've got people who are closest to your customers, closest to the roles that they're they're doing and if you're not listening to what it is they they actually need then are you really setting them up for success because that's real and that that then goes to the fact to the fact then is the business being set up for success because if you're not thinking about those sorts of things and that you've got the best of intentions because you're you're trying to go down that tick list to comply to all the things you need to around risk management um, to be certified or whatever it may end up being um, but you've got so distracted by the list that you've actually forgot the most important resources you have, which is your people, then, you know, not only are you not actually managing the risk in your organisation because, um, you know, when you look at things like insider threat and disengagement, they are some really significant risk. And so if your people aren't engaged, then you're never managing the risk. But the other flip side is that these people who have so much knowledge can, can contribute to what you need them to share in knowledge and insights about the best way to serve as customers, the best way to help your operations. Um, they can actually be of great value. They can also take pride in that work. So then when they leave and go home, there's one part of their life that they are feeling like that they are connected to. And hopefully when they do go home, because of the positive you know, influence you're having on their life, there's less stress so they go home, they can be more engaged there in a more positive way as well. I mean, that's an ideal world, but we at least want to try and give people that opportunity, right? So not wear them down at work. So when they go home, they've got less tolerance for the family. It would be great if they feel like they're contributing at their work. So when they go home, they can still have more meaningful conversations because that's what they're accustomed to. Yeah, and I, I think that that's where when we were talking about that, pot, that the intention around the risk and the opportunities and creating that positive mindset is this fabulous intention. So I know that, um, that there's so many more and more hours that we could talk about this, but how can people get hold of you and find out more about their own or their organisational community risk? Yeah, well, uh, absolutely. They can get hold of me either through LinkedIn um, Lisa Sisson, there's not too many of us around, thank goodness. Uh, so, and the business being Unearth, or if you just want to check us out on the website, it's unearth.com.au. And um, you can absolutely connect through me through, through that as well. So, um, but yeah, keeping in mind that the work that we're doing really does come back to, it's really, it's the only person-centred approach. So, to so, so. Out there. <laughs> yeah, there's so. only a couple of minutes left, sorry, Lisa, That's and right. I just wanted to say um, it's S-I-S-S-O-N for right. people that um, are looking at Lisa on the an L-I-S-A for Lisa. And if you were to give some advice to your younger self, what, what might that be? The advice I'd probably give to my younger self is to know that you are loved, be courageous, and uh, just be you, just show up wholeheartedly. 
Beautiful, what absolutely fabulous advice and, and some really heartfelt topics and, and interesting topics in terms of running and leading organisations and running and leading your own life in terms of thinking about things in your life in that risk versus opportunity way. And I think we've talked a lot in different lenses around empowerment today. So thank you so, so much for being on the show, Lisa. Thank you, Michelle. It's been a real privilege to be here. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And for now, that's it for today's episode. And thank you to everybody watching and to all of the fabulous fan club and viewers. We, we really enjoy getting all the different messages about how much you're enjoying the series here on the Mindset Michelle TV show. And we really do keep hoping that these tips and suggestions and observations help you to empower you in your own life and to create creating that mindset for success. But for now, from my heart to your heart, be great, be wonderful and be yourself.